Praise the Lord. And welcome again. It's that time of the day when we must, we must examine the state of the union. Our daily broadcasts where we look at the continued and continuing relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church. And we focus around the word in which he says, tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. Now, in returning or in, in telling his people to return to him, to him in himself, to return to him, I want to bring to our attention the situation or the understanding in returning to him because by implication we have walked away from him otherwise the word return would not be necessary he is asking us to come back to him he is asking us to return to the place where it's all about him or where he is the focus or where he is the it or the oomph the thing that gives us aplomb and apogee and like some we say the one that is responsible for the glide in our stride the arms in our bounds the one that makes us tick is what I mean so today we look at returning to him in the words or in such words as oh lord i return to you i'm coming back home to you i return to you i'm tired of the hardness of my way you know the bible actually says that the way of the transgressor shall be hard so if your way is hard Perhaps that is a call to check your way. Lord, I just I just return to you. I know I've walked away. So I, I want to find my way back to you. Or, or I return to you. Now I'm saying all that to give the sense of the business of humbling yourself before the Lord. I'm told that there are at least 28 different scriptures which point at the matter of humbling ourselves and then again before the Lord. But what exactly does it mean? This thing that is, is, is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 14 as a as a necessary requirement for God to heal our land what exactly is this business of humble yourself in returning to him he says tell my people to return to me to return means you've got to admit that there's something wrong about where you were headed or where you were facing or what you were doing or what you were thinking or what governed your way of life you have to first admit that and then actually turn away from it back to God and I have said in previous episodes of this series of broadcasts on the state of the union that the word return is used there 
especially in returning to God, is really akin to the word repent, which just refers to a change of your way. But to change your way, you have to first of all have come to the end of yourself. Did you hear that? You have to have come to an end of your self. Self is usually the problem. Trying to get it done your own way. Trying to get it done how you think it ought to be done. Try to get it done by yourself, for yourself, in yourself, through yourself. The end of self is characterized by a realization that there's something superior, stronger, better, mightier, more excellent than you. An end of yourself. You must come to an end of yourself. That's different from coming to yourself. That's realizing, realizing the state of things. Coming to an end of yourself is that you have been pursuing things with yourself as the object or the goal to be satisfied. So it says in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, so you can't turn from your wicked ways except you first humble yourself. Come to a realization that yourself is not the it. Or in fact it's not good enough. You have to come to that realization before you can turn from your way. He says, my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their and, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. Their sin. S-I-N. One singular. Their sin. The sin of turning from him unto themselves. Whatever else you did in that process is just the offshoot of the primary sin of taking your eyes away from God. He says, and I will heal their land. He says, now my eyes shall be opened and my eyes and my ears attend unto the prayer that they make. But first, they've got to fulfill some conditions. Humble yourself. You have to come to a realization that is simply not working. This is not how it ought to be. So what exactly is this matter of humbling yourself? Perhaps we should ask the prodigal son. You understand what I mean by the prodigal son? I don't know who called him the prodigal son because I tried to search for that piece of scripture using the prodigal son and it didn't produce the scripture. I'm told by the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English that to humble yourself is to show that you are not too proud to ask for something or to admit that you are wrong. Is to show that you are not too proud to ask for something or to admit that you are wrong. To show that you are not too proud to ask for something and to admit that you are wrong. Something has to happen to you to bring you to these two levels where you are not too proud to ask for something or where you are able to admit that you are wrong. Because until then, something else is going to be working in you. It's a five-letter word. P-R-O-I-D-E. Pride. It is pride that makes us resist these two situations. Asking for help 
or admitting that you are wrong. So I said, perhaps let's ask the prodigal son. Now, as we know in the story from uh, in Luke chapter 15 from verse 11, and as I read it, it seems like the Lord catapulted me to two worlds so far away in the past and brought me to something of an understanding of the state of things. So I began to read Luke chapter 15 from verse 11 and it says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. We all know the story of the prodigal son, so I'm not going to read that scripture because it's going to consume time. But he started by saying, or he starts by saying, A certain man had two sons. And instantly, the Holy Spirit took it from me and changed the certain man to God. A certain God had two sons. One named Adam, one named Jesus. Now you see it. Adam was the son of God. Jesus was the son of God. Both of them had instructions from the Father. Both of them were described in the Bible as the image of God. Both of them were set on the earth with the dominion of God to reign and to determine things. Now, the one, never mind how he got there, but the one thought in his heart I need to be like God to be able to survive on the earth that will be Adam because that's what made them eat the fruit never mind that his wife gave it to him because in eating it he gave in to the thing behind it and why did his wife eat it because the devil had said to her the devil, or if you like, the serpent, had said to her, God told you people not to eat of this fruit because he does not want you to be like the gods who know good and evil. So, if you eat it, you are saying in your heart, Ah, so God does not want me to be like the gods, knowing good versus evil. In other words, you are eating because you want to be like the gods. So it's about you. It's now about you wanting to be something. Never mind that Adam and Eve were already made in the likeness, in the image and in the likeness of God. That is to say, they were already in the dimension of God. Because the life in them had the capacity to determine or to discern good from evil. God just told them, don't read the world from that perspective. Because I made everything good. Now if the word good is there, then of course by implication there will be a bad or evil. Before God began to create in Genesis chapter 1, the world was in a certain state. Now everything God created, the Bible says, and God saw that it was good. By implication, what was there before was evil. So one determined that he wanted to be able to discern good and evil, like the gods, to be like the gods. So he ate the fruit. And we know his end. It was destruction. He failed in his God-given assignment in the earth. His end was death and destruction. That's the first son, Adam. The second son, on the other hand, the one we now call the last Adam, which is Jesus, he came in just about the same way as Adam. Adam was given a portion of the earth, the Garden of Eden. Jesus was given a portion of the earth, the lost ship of Israel, the geographical territory called Israel. Because he said, I must be about all the cities 
I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel. I must be about all the cities. I can't stay in one place. I must be about all the cities of Israel. Both of them were given a definite place to, to exercise their God-given dominion. But Adam wanted to be like God. You know what is written about Jesus? <laughs> in Philippians chapter 2, he says from verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ also. Who did not think it robbery to be equal to God? But he did what? He humbled himself and became obedient like unto a servant. Even to the death on the cross. He knew that he was in the form and image of God. He didn't think it robbery to be in that state. He knew his place. But the Bible says he stepped down. Adam rather wanted to step up. Because it had been suggested that God was denying them the step up. So they wanted the step up. So they fell. Jesus stepped down. He humbled himself and did what the Father wanted. Adam exalted him or attempted to exalt himself and did exactly what the Father didn't want. His end was death and destruction. The end of Jesus we know. Philippians 2 continues from verse 9. He said, Wherefore he has been highly exalted. So James 5, 4 says to humble yourself before the Lord and you shall be exalted. Adam attempted to exalt himself or in his mind he was exalted. And so he got humbled to the dust. Dust you are and dust you shall return. Jesus, who taught it not robbery to be equal with God, He knew it was no sin for him to think equality with God. He called himself the Son of God. The people got angry with him because he was equating himself with God by calling himself the Son of God. Because to say you are the Son of God puts you at par in the dimension of God. And they said, off, off, away with this guy. Who does he think he is? Equating himself with God. And they were going to destroy him for that. But the Bible says, although Jesus knew his status with God, he did not parade himself as such. He humbled himself unto, one, obedience like a servant, and then unto death. And the Bible says, wherefore God has highly exalted him to the throne in heaven. Adam was debased, abased as it were to the throne in the dust. One sought to do his own will. The other sought to forsake his will and to do the will of the Father. What am I getting at? God says, tell my people to return to me. What exactly is this business of humbling yourself. Now, evidently, you may have your own opinion. You may have your own ideas which you think may work. And in fact, they may already have been working. Otherwise, why the call to return? The prodigal son's way worked for a while, but he got to a point, the Bible says, he came to himself. He realized that something was wrong. And he said to himself, that even the servants in my father's house, he said, even the lot of the servants in my father's house is better than this one, that I'm sharing food with swine. Let me return to my father. 
and perhaps paraventure he will take me back as a servant did you hear that the son of the house is now willing to be a servant but why did he leave home because he exalted himself in his head as a son he said give me my inheritance give me my inheritance i want to go and live my own life so he got his inheritance is that not where we have been somebody has preached to us this business of we have an inheritance and they have shown us how to get the inheritance if you sow you will reap they've shown us how to get a better life they have told us that jesus died so that we may have abundance in this life never mind that abundance in this life is not exactly the same as abundant life that is in or and of god So they have taught us things which have exalted the self in us. Now we want to be something. We want to occupy the earth because we are something. And that has made it difficult for us to humble ourselves even to carry out the will of God. So I asked somebody the other day, if your gold falls inside the gutter, will you not bend down to pick it? And he stopped and he looked at me. I said, if you can do, if you can retrieve your gold that has fallen among the trash, why can't you in the same way bend down and receive a soul, retrieve a soul that has fallen among trash? Why can't we abase ourselves, putting your hand in the gutter, to do that which is necessary, to save that which God once saved? In exalting ourselves, we make it impossible for us to abase ourselves to do that which is needful. So we have been taught what amounts to exalting ourselves in the name of God. And so we have taken the principles of God, true, we have taken the principles of God and we have used them to better our lives. We have used the principles of God to be exalted in this life. We have become this and that. But in that state, it has become difficult to live for your neighbor. It has become difficult to set your will down so that the will of the Father regarding the salvation of neighbor, for example, may thrive, may prosper. But when the second Adam, the second son came, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. Yet we have been taught that by our own selves we can do something. In what you sow, you reap. They have taught us that there is a better life in Jesus. For who? Self. So they have pointed us as self and in so doing, turned our eyes from the Father. And in turning our eyes from the Father, they have turned our eyes to our own will. So we have begun to use the principles of God to do that which we will. Jesus said, or Jesus refused to use the power of God to turn stone to bread so that he can eat. Jesus refused to be exalted with the kingdoms of the earth even though it was promised him by, by one who actually had control over the kingdoms of the earth, the devil. The promise was nothing if it was not real, or the temptation was nothing if it was not real. Jesus was tempted with exalting himself each time, not just those three times that we know to be popular. I have counted up to about 35 times that Jesus was tempted to exalt himself. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He said, Father, in the volume of the book it is written, I have come to do thy will, O God. 
They offered him food. They said, Master, eat. He said, you don't understand. I have food that you don't understand. And it is to finish the works of my father. Jesus had a will. Jesus had a right to life like every one of us. The very same life that you are exalting now using the principles of God. Using the principles of the voice of this world. Or the voices in this world. Just before the cross, he got another opportunity to exalt himself. He even prayed that the self be exalted over death. But then he said, not my will, but in your spirit. And he went to the cross and he died for you and I. At that time, it seemed most silly. Even his disciples ran away. They couldn't understand that. Because they imagined that he had come to bring the kingdom of God upon Israel. They thought it was about that. And this is what we have carried on about. Self. So God says, tell my people to return to me. Enough of self. Enough of these things we do in the, in the attempt to exalt ourselves. I'm not talking about exalt yourself to the level of MD or to be the president. Not necessarily that. But in making life about you. You exalt yourself. As basic as that may be. In making life and living about you. In allowing those teachers to teach you about life and living about you. You exalt yourself. And God says, tell my people to return. It's time to realize that it's not about you. Just as it was not about Jesus when he was here. Today, it's about God in Jesus. For us. But in his time, it was about God in himself. So he said, the works that you see me do, I'm not the one doing them. It's my father in me. Jesus had opportunity to exalt himself. While they praised him for his works, he could have kept quiet and let it and, and received the praise. He said, no. It's about the father. Tell my people to return to me. It's time to come back to God. It's time to come back to God. It's time for God to be exalted in our lives. It's time for God to be exalted in our circumstances. It's time for God to be exalted in all that pertains to us. And my time is up. But we'll see you again tomorrow. Same time. Until then. Consider your way. Examine yourself. What is life and living about when you are concerned? God says I should tell you to retrace your steps and return to him. Come back to the place where it's about him. Never mind those people who are teaching those things that, that, that promise a better life for you. It was never about you. It was never about me. It has always been about God. He says, tell my people to return to me. Until we see you again tomorrow, stay blessed.